All right, Elena, welcome to the Physical Product Movement Podcast. How's it going? It's going great. Happy Tuesday. Happy Tuesday to you as well. We're both in kind of colder climate, so you got your beanie on and I've got my sweatshirt on on my end. I, I usually have a little space heater on under my desk too, but don't want to come in through <laughs> on the audio, so I'll just have to be a little colder. <laughs> yeah, it'd be a little chilly. It's okay. Yeah. Good, well, good for the bloodstream. <laughs> Exactly. Good for the blood strain. That's a good way to look, look at it. Um, well, I'm super excited to talk to you. This is the first time that we've ever formally chatted, but obviously I've been following you on the socials and in your OMG CPG Facebook group and all the places um, and just stoked to get to know you better and to hear more about TBH and everything that you're up to. Um, but to start, we always like to start this off with some kind of a quote or mantra, something that is inspirational for you either now or in the past? Yeah. So um, I, I've become, I never was when I was younger, but I've become a little bit of a history nerd and um, love Winston Churchill. And he has a couple of really good quotes, but one of my favorite is uh, that success is going from failure to failure without a lack of enthusiasm. And I think that one's especially special just because Often when, when folks talk about their lives, um, it is easier or maybe more memorable uh, to highlight the positives, but often there are a lot of hardships and a lot of negatives in between. So for me, those are kind of the building blocks. And I, I love that quote, it kind of acknowledges that there are failures, but it doesn't treat them as such. So I, I often repeat that one to myself. I love that. I love that. And uh, yeah, because you're right, like people in general tend to highlight successes and on social media that's kind of what everyone puts forward but it really is like behind the scenes there's so much failure that happens and you have to be able to move from each phase of failure to you know enthusiastically in order to really reach what reach your goals and the failure it doesn't ever stop it's not like once you succeed no. yeah the failure stops right yeah I read something I'm gonna butcher this um this memory but there was something about like if you bought apple stock in like, you know, 50 years ago or something, or, or you know, 40 years ago, um, that was great, but you would have had to go bankrupt like 400 times. Like you would have had to go through like 400 failures in order wow. to truly like come out of it. And that's just another way of looking at it. But, but yeah, you're right. It's just, it's always ups and downs. For sure. So, I mean, I'm going to ask you, I'm going to kind of put you on the spot with that quote then. Yeah. So you've been in the CPG space since 2008, according to your LinkedIn. Is that right? That is. Yeah. My okay. first job wasn't, wasn't in food and beverage. Um, so I've been in operations, I guess, since 2008, first job out of college was with wow. a, a manufacturer who made things in Asia, um, and imported, imported into the United States. Um, I, I worked with them part-time when I was in school and I studied abroad, came back a little broke. So just took a job like filing and doing random stuff around the office. And then when I graduated in 2008, I didn't have anything lined up and their logistics manager had just left. And they were like, well, you seem to know where the invoices are. <laughs> Maybe just give this a go. <laughs> um, and, and yeah, I kind of took, took on that job. I graduated with international relations as a major in art history and really wanted to gravitate to more like human relations and languages and art, um, but kind of fell into this job. And I was, I was there during the dot-com boom when we, mm -hmm. you know, we used to sell into big box stores. We made composters and greenhouses, imported them and then sold them to like the BJ's, Walmart's, Costco's, Sam's Club's. Um, and it was fine. Um, but I was with them through the dot-com boom. And normally I'd have like 20 orders a day, but then I walked in on a Monday to 5,000 when we launched on Costco.com. Oh, wow. And I imagine like I was printing out every single order, keying it into a computer, sending it to our warehouse. So after like we dealt with that little disaster of like hiring temps and making sure those orders go out, I kind of took a step back and realized that there was just a better way to do it. Um, I've always liked technology, but really again, didn't really see myself going into business. Although my parents might disagree with that if they look at me from an <laughs> earlier age. Um, so I spent two, two and a half years at that company kind of re doing their internal infrastructure. So learning EDI, learning how to map systems. Um, and we grew from about one and a half million to 22 to 23 million without, without hiring anyone. It was still just kind of me and the CFO wow. and, um, and our CEO. So I really loved the kind of optimization to growth scenario that, that I helped create and um, 
fell in love with operations um, and how it allows a company to really grow and scale. Um, and then in my mid twenties, realized I didn't, I didn't love green houses or composters, and I really wanted to connect <laughs> more with a brand. So I, in, you know, kind of in, in the middle of a um, a turning point in life, just quit my job and walked around Whole Foods. I was like, I love food. I want to work in food and walked around Whole Foods, picked up packages and just emailed the like, hello, ad emails on the back. Um, did that for maybe a week, like a couple hours a day, just spent in Whole Foods. And then finally a baby food company in Brooklyn emailed me back. Um, they were just getting going and just moved to Brooklyn from Massachusetts, just got into Whole Foods. So I joined the Little Duck Organics team. That was my first kind of entry point into CPG, at least natural and organic, which is the space I tend to live, live and thrive in. Um, and I was with them for two and a half years. I love CPG. I love the organic natural space. I thought the people were incredible and full of life and motivation and desire to bring, you know, new good food into our homes. And I kind of fell in love with that. I think food is one of these things that cross cultures, cross languages. I'm Russian. So I think food is important to me as like a cultural identity. And um, I was really just so happy to, to fall into CPG. That's amazing. That's amazing. I was going to ask you, um, because your education, you said, is kind of in art and literature, operations is obviously, some would think on the opposite side of that, right? Like one is kind of yeah. more right, right brain and a creative and the other is more left brain, more logical processes, systems and that kind of thing. How was that adaption or adaptation for you and kind of that process of using, not that you, not that you couldn't use both sides of your brain, but that you kind of went from one side yeah. to the other and found that you liked it. Like, what was that process like for you? Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm like a terrible artist, so maybe I'm not <laughs> as far in one direction as as my degrees might think, um, really like art history is much more history. And um, I, I think that being an immigrant, I moved to the States when I was six. So I had to learn English in elementary school and really didn't know it until about third, third, fourth grade. Um, I think that kind of allowed me to think a little bit differently. My parents have worked really hard and um, are always persistent and kind of taught me determination. And we didn't really have giving up or, um, any kind of like weak, weak thought when I, when I was growing up, they kind of just moved somewhere totally new, didn't know anyone, didn't know the language and um, kind of persevered. Like I never, you know, felt any kind of, um, yeah, I felt just like all the other kids, except I didn't know the language. So I think the, the change for me, um, and maybe this is just me, but I think a lot of operators might feel this. I think there's actually a lot of creativity in operations. Maybe it's more mathematical creativity, but mm -hmm. Um, and maybe it's, you know, spreadsheet, like spreadsheet creativity, but I think that, um, building a supply chain for something completely unknown is perhaps to me the same as, um, kind of a, a creative outlet mm -hmm. and, um, truly like I did have internships that connected to my major. So I majored in international affairs, wanted to work for the UN and my secondary kind of concentration was art history and, and Spanish and. I interned at the UN and I worked at Christie's auction house and both of those experiences kind of showed me that that wasn't the place where I felt great. Like I walked into an auction mm. house and would stare at art, but truly it's a business and that's not why I was there. So I didn't really connect with that environment and interning for the UN was amazing and inspiring and I love what they're doing, but like I, I need faster action. So I spent, you know, six months organizing a meeting for heads of state when I studied abroad in Barcelona and planning something for six months. Like I just, I wanted kind of more, either more action or like more results. Like I love working with something tangible that we can taste that we can, you know, mm. get 10 people around a table and we can all eat it. Um, and while even in CPG things take, you know, you, you want to work with a retailer that might take 12 months. It might take 18 months, but, um, I don't know. It feels like there's something kind of tangible connected to it. So um, I still think there's a lot of, a lot of creativity in operations, or maybe that's how my brain has created it. Yeah. <laughs> no, that absolutely makes sense. And, and kind of coming from what you're talking about where, you know, um, the UN is kind of, would be kind of like the, would be kind of like the pinnacle of someone who's doing international studies. That's like kind of as good yeah. as it gets, right? There's like lots totally. of different things you you could do, but like, 
you're here in the US, but you're working with countries all over the world. But then you get in there and you see how much red tape there is and kind of how slowly things move. Um, and I'm sure if you were to have stuck with that, you would have climbed the ladder and done great, just like you have in CPG. But um, and maybe you would have been able to make things happen faster, right? But I, but I, but I hear what you're saying too about um, one of the cool parts about CPG being that you're that you're that you're selling something tangible, and that even if it yeah. takes 12 months to get into retail, like you can throw up a website and you can make and ship a product out to somebody within a few days. Yeah, and I think that a part of like that acknowledgement of the world being greater than I has resonated with me. So I, in my career, have gravitated to doing good where we can and making it as tangible as can be. So there's a lot of companies mm -hmm. now that you can donate to, but you could also volunteer or you can work with, you know, a company that has like tangible impact. Um, so mm -hmm. I think that kind of um, impact has resonated with me and, and I try to lean more toward sustainability. That's amazing. Um, kind of speaking about operations, you obviously you didn't, you didn't study in college, you studied something that helped you use your brain and I'm sure learn how to communicate well, right? So you've kind of had that skill set. Operations and stuff, how did you how did you go about learning how to do it? Yeah. I, I think <laughs> that a lot of other um like entrepreneurs or, or folks in the CPG space will would resonate with this would resonate with them. But I think a lot of times, especially for me, I learn by doing. So that's kind of innately what happened. But um, as I've gotten older, I also acknowledge that that's just how I learn. So for ops and CPG or ops in general, like you, I kind of just was thrown into the fire and, and had to pick up the pieces and, um, and learn. Um, I think that that's kind of special because you immediately see impact, right? Like there's no period where you're studying and then you actually do it. You're, you're literally doing it in the moment. Um, and I think moving from kind of like import export or import export as my first role more toward domestic manufacturing and CPG, where there are a lot of mm. more tinier parts, you know, a CPG product can kind of on shelf run anywhere from like five to let's say $40. I was dealing with greenhouses, which were a, you know, a thousand, two thousand dollar purchase. So one pallet was you know one item and here I'm dealing with boxes and a lot more core, get a lot more packaging. Um, but I think you kind of just learn. And, and I also am a strong believer in community. So as soon as I don't know something, I'm, um, I'm, I don't hesitate to ask. So you mentioned OMG CPG, that kind of group cre was created because um, a, a now very close friend um, in the space who then was just like a new friend. Both of us were um, in CPG. I had worked at a brand working with extrusion and she was starting a company that was making an extruded product. So we were truly connected as girls who love extrusion, which perhaps are, were few and far in between in 2010. Um, and, and we kind of shared stories and realized that I knew a lot that she didn't and she knew something maybe in other parts of business that I did not. So OMG CPG was really created as this weighted knowledge share and mind share. Um, and it's now a community of like 2,600 um, founders, operators in CPG. I think we still have a backlog of folks that we were, we're letting in slowly but surely. Um, and, and it's incredible to, to see how open people are with information. And really the scariest part is asking. So as soon as I got past the fear of the ask and the fear of like seeming that you don't, seeming like you might not know everything, um, which is often almost always the case, then um, people are, are willing to help and support and um, you, you live and you learn. I love that. And I'll just throw in a quick plug too, and we'll link it up in the podcast notes, but um, OMG CPG is a fantastic group to join. It was one of the first groups that I joined when I, um, when I kind of made my foray into the C CPG space, um, at least on the software side of things where I am now. Um, and that group and the startup C CPG group are probably my two favorite because they're super active. And like you said, people in the group are super helpful um, and you can pop in there and ask a question about any topic. I try to go in and um, answer questions and try to be helpful when I can. I should probably jump in there more often, but awesome group. So for those of you listening, if you're looking for that community, you know, like Elena mentioned, um, a place where you can go and connect and share and learn and 
ask questions and you know all that stuff um, I definitely recommend that group it's solid thanks thanks I think um a lot of the folks that joined in the earlier years uh when Court Courtney and I started OMG CPG are now you know founders who've gone through exits and just oh, like wow. you like we uh, might kind of be busy with other things but I think often people jump in and help like as much as they can. So you do get these like pockets of folks who are super incredible, um, very knowledgeable. And as long as the question I found, like maybe the, the biggest learning I have is from that group is like how to ask questions, right? Like even now fundraising, like the ask is one of the most important parts and I want to make it easy for people, but um, there's a lot of us in, in OMG CPG and in Startup CPG, I love that group too. They're, they're around, like people are willing to help, especially if you ask a question and it, it's kind of an, you know, like, where do I get this ingredient or does anyone know X, Y, Z, you know, bigger questions like how do I manufacture or what do I do about this or that? Like maybe that becomes like a Zoom call with a couple of brands, but knowledge sharing has been absolutely incredible. And it's really a way to like level up your game without, I mean, it's, it's like a free little, I see it as like a free little MBA education. Like I was considering getting um, an MBA and then I realized that like, I'm literally getting it every day. So. Yeah. That's awesome. I love that. Um, I wanted to ask you something you mentioned when you transitioned from your first role in op op operations at the first company that you were at after college and you kind of transitioned into the CPG space that you decided to go to Whole Foods and walk the aisles looking at products and then just contacting the companies on the backs of the labels. Like that's a pretty creative way to look for a job. Like, did you come up with that on your own? Did someone tell you to do that? Like I have to ask yeah. about that. I think um, I did come up with that on my own. My entire family was not pleased. And <laughs> especially because I quit my job before I had another one set up, which is. Oh yeah, that's um, a no-no. They, yeah. It's, it's a no-no. Some it's people a, don't like that, yeah. <laughs> not at all, not at all. I come from, you know, like a Russian family. So I think the job I had was fine and they didn't at first see anything wrong with it. Now they're, they're very proud and happy that I kind of take my own, <laughs> take my own road often. Um, but no, I didn't, I didn't hear that, that it, that wasn't advice I got from someone that was just um, a spontaneous, you know, looking back, like great decision, but in the moment, like very questionable choice that I made. Um, <laughs> some advice that I've gotten later in life that follows a similar framework was, um, and this, you know, ties into community a lot. If I ever kind of need something or I'm trying to learn a new skill, I usually think of five people who generally might know something in that realm and ask them that question, but also ask them for five other people that I can talk with. Mm. And at the very least, you get like 25 other humans that are either probably interesting, number one, but also could help you with whatever that information is. So, um, you know, if I, uh, like, for example, currently I need an accountant. So I emailed five people that I think might have good accountants. And if they don't, perhaps they have friends. So really like leveraging just hum humans, other humans, like we're surrounded by each other all the time. So we can, we yeah. can leverage each other's knowledge that probably is easy because just it's in our heads. Um, but that's, it follows a similar framework of just like go out there and ask and, and do it, whether it's through others or through yourself. <laughs> yeah. I like that a lot. That's a really, that's a really um, simple, but powerful framework to follow. And I can see how that would apply to not only finding a job, but when you're in your job and you need help and want to connect with others and ask questions and that kind of thing. That's like a, that's a cool way to like um, talk to the people that you know might be able to help, but also recognize that they might know someone that you don't know, or it kind of, they, they might know something or someone that you don't know that can help you. And so just by asking them and connect you with more people, your network expands and then your likelihood of being able to solve the problem increases exponentially yeah. as well. That's awesome. I love that. I love Thanks. little like simple rules like that that can have such an awesome impact. Um, yeah. yeah, that's really cool. So operation stuff, I'm curious because you've obviously got a lot of experience at various brands on your own. Your current brand is the CEO as well, which I want to get to that. But as far as operations go, um, you said that you learned it on the job, which is 
which is awesome when you needed help or when you had when you um, ran into roadblocks, you would go to communities and kind of find the answers that way, ask people for help. Um, just kind of in general, what are some of the kind of the best practices that you found over your years in, op in operations when it comes to manufacturing, sourcing, supply chain, all that stuff? Like what are some best practices that come to mind knowing that um, not every situation is the same and it depends is probably going to be your answer for a lot of things, but maybe some just kind of a general best of practices that you found to be useful for you. Yeah, um, it depends is definitely is definitely the answer. I think especially <laughs> to like anyone who might listen to this or anyone in the CPG space these days, I think the last couple of years have just been so volatile that mm -hmm. perhaps, you know, a good good words to live by is just um, like be iterative and constantly be adaptable, uh, which is really hard for this industry because we deal with inventory and storage and physical goods. So it's really hard as opposed to, you know, tech where maybe it's code or um, engineer, like backend infrastructure here, we have warehouses full of, of things. And if something goes wrong, mm -hmm. or if we don't have paper or corrugate or humans, uh, human labor, um, we, we deal with a lot of challenges and roadblocks. I think one thing in operations that's important to consider, and I have to remind myself of this all the time because it's very easy to kind of get excited and, and want and wanting is fantastic. But I think looking at information, looking at data is really important. So even for CPG, we're an early brand. We're only out a hundred, we're coming up on like a hundred days in two days. We launched November 1st. So data is a little bit of a struggle because we almost don't, we don't have enough, or at least I want more maybe mm -hmm. is the better way to say it. I think in ops, you have to deal with the constant juggle of supply and demand. And I think making sure that the door between sales, marketing and ops is ever fluid is really, really important. Finance kind of I think deals with like the repercussions of these conversations, <laughs> but between sales, ops and, and marketing, I think it's so crucial for everyone to be in communication because sales and marketing really drive, drive the business forward. Um, and operations has to make sure that everything is available and there, but the dialogue between those three entities earlier in my career, I just remember, you know, a, like someone on the sales team would like get us into a, a retailer and all of a sudden we would on the ops side, receive POs. We would just get them. Be like, I'm sorry, what? Like in a month or in <laughs> a week? Like, how come we didn't converse about this? How come there was no dialogue? So later on in my career, I realized that truly just like being in a room and being able to talk about what a depart which what each department is doing is really important. So um, I think really that that's my best advice or, or maybe the words that I live by is just constant communication. Um, and I think maybe one other thing to note is how important marketing is like as a, as a entity for any CPG brand, right? Like sales, at least on the retail side is a matter of, of doors and shelves and velocities. And of course, there's a much deeper conversation about promotional schedules and how you work with those retailers to improve those sales. But in a world where, you know, now we have, Web 3.0 and NFTs and like all of these other elements that can create these communities that are really powerful for brands. I think from the marketing side, like we have to make sure that like the email part of your company is functioning properly and there's revenue that can be created there and uh, your connection to an audience and community building is there and that can be leveraged at other at other parts of a company's life cycle. Um, so I, I think at the end of the day, even when I started this new role in-house, when I haven't been in-house in a very long time, I think mm. communication between me and my teammates is, is kind of first and foremost. I love that. I love that. And that actually segues well into the next thing I want to talk to you about, which is your current How great. role <laughs> as CEO. Yeah, you plan that well. So you're currently the CEO at TBH, which I'm fond of that name because my initials are TBH. So it just works out really well. Amazing. Taylor Bryant Howe. I love it. We so, did it for you. Well done there. I knew it. Thank you. You and you and Noah. 
That's right. My back. Um, yeah. So I obviously heard about the company through you and then saw that Noah, is it a Schnapp? Schnapp? Yeah. Schnapp. Mm -hmm. Schnapp. Okay. That he's part of it. Obviously I've seen Stranger Things and love it. And that caught my eye. So tell me about how you came to join TBH and what you guys are up to over there. Yes. So um, as many things in my life, the piece is kind of just um, maybe not accidentally, but seemingly to me accidentally fell into play. So in 2019, um, 2020 and 2021, I really focused more in tech and um, kind of took one foot out of CPG, still advised and um, consulted a, a number of brands, but really tried to focus on more of the tech side, more focused on litter actually. And then in 2021, after the pandemic kind of took, took its own toll on me, I stepped aside from my tech company and came back to CPG more with a focus on sustainability, acknowledging that we have to make a brand that lives on a shelf or travels and it can't be just in a completely compostable solution. So there is this inherent difficult nature between CPG and sustainability, but I came back after researching litter and our recycling streams really invigorated to make more of a powerful difference in the CPG space when it comes to our planet as a whole. And at first that looked like me consulting with some brands that I really, really loved. I was an interim CEO, a COO for a, um, a new hard seltzer company called Half Past, which is really delicious. Um, and then as I was kind of phasing myself out of that role, they were bringing in a DevOps. We knew it was kind of temporary to get them through um, the in initial stages of their production. I was connected with the venture studio out of which CB, uh, TBH came from. And really they found me, they were looking for someone from the CPG space to take the brand to market and scale, scale it pretty aggressively. And I love uh, fast growth. That's kind of where hmm. my energy comes from. So first and foremost, I, I actually um, didn't know Noah was involved, didn't know a lot about the product, but I talked to the venture studio and they told me, a little bit about the background of how the company came to be. They had actually worked with Noah for a while on truly identifying something that he loves. And he was 15 when this process started. And as wow. a 15 year old, you know, he, he's been an actor for a long time. I actually didn't watch Stranger Things. So I wasn't familiar with him. I'm like the only person I think in, in the world probably. Um, but I, I loved the fact that UVS really took the time to understand who he was like as a human and what he loved. And what he loved was breakfast, he had Nutella kind of as a practice growing up. And when they really dug into the ingredients, the components, palm oil specifically, how much it was not a positive player in the natural ecosystem as a whole and how much sugar was in the product, they really committed to creating a better version of it. So I came on board um, in the summer of last year they had already kind of created the framework for what TBH was. We had a name, we had a brand identity, there was a story there. Uh, we had identified a manufacturer who feels like an amazing partner to us. And I took us through the last couple of rounds of formulation. Uh, for me, taste in CPG is number one. If something tastes crappy, no one will buy it again. They might buy it once, but you want the people that like live and breathe, always have it in their fridge, always have it in their cupboard, or at least that's what I always gravitate toward as far as making CPG products. We want it to be incredible. So I tried it and I was like, okay, this is great. We took it to the final formulation. I think we landed on like the 14th version um, and Noah loved it. Uh, his whole family tried it. We all tried it. Collectively, we agreed and we prepared for, for the next couple of months, launched on November 1st, uh, digitally native. So we wanted to stay D to C for, for, you know, depending on how launch went, we wanted to at least launch digitally native and really make this mm -hmm. a product that lives um, first on the internet. And that launch was so much more powerful than I expected. I've not worked with a celebrity brand, but I did talk to a couple of other operator friends who have been involved with celebrities just to really understand mm -hmm. the scale. And as an operator, I, in this role, really have to juggle my um, data-driven numerical operator self with kind of the CEO visionary part that is constantly fighting the fact that, you know, we want to be here in six months, let's like do this thing and maybe the data doesn't show it. So it really is a, a struggle, which I think makes me a powerful CEO because I do have this kind of um, reasoning in my mind 
uh, knowing how much goes into manufacturing, how difficult the process is, the fact that storage, you know, we, our, our product will be at a facility. We don't want it to sit too long. We want it to turn fairly quickly. So I think that actually makes me more powerful. And um, the community we've created for TDH since launch has been super fun, to be honest. It's just um, people really, especially vegans, like people who are vegan haven't had Nutella. I talked to a man in his 60s who hasn't had Nutella in 30 years and he tried TDH. Wow. And it's like, this is amazing. Like, I, I'm so excited. And then parents we're finding are giving it to their kids more just because the sugar content is, is better than, we have 50% less sugar than Nutella. Our first ingredient is hazelnuts and we don't use palm oil and kind of have a, a, a pillar uh, for sustainability. So, so far it's been uh, just like we started with just a little bit of a roller coaster ride, but it is, it is absolutely just delicious and fun and uh, feels like a good culmination of, of the last kind of 10 or 15 years of, of my career. I love that. I love hearing that story and kind of how it came out or came, came to be your role there um, through connections and happenstance and how it kind of, even though you um, left the CPG space to pursue tech for a little while, that when you came back, you had the chance to kind of marry what you were doing when you left with you know, what you did before and what you're doing now and kind of how it's all kind of culminated into your current role. I think it's really awesome. Um, what surprised you the most? So I think, is this, is this right that this is your first, um, this is your first kind of non-operator CEO role? Like what has surprised you the most about um, being, the, being the, the CEO that maybe you didn't, you know, that you didn't expect to happen? That's a great question. Um, you know, I, there's a couple of things that are floating through my mind. So I'll just tell you the first one that, yeah. <laughs> that comes out. Um, I love working remotely as a person. It really suits my personality and how I work. And I appreciated always open workspaces just because I was a much bigger extrovert pre-COVID. Now I think I've gravitated toward the other side or maybe I don't remember how to socialize anymore. <laughs> uh, and and I, I think when, when starting Rodeo CPG, we were a fully remote team. Like Zach was in Colorado. Mm -hmm. I was um, kind of gallivanting around, but we were fully remote. And I, I truly love that environment for me. I work much better, especially for deeper work when I'm kind of quarantine, not to use that word for, for any <laughs> pandemic reasons, but truly like sequestered from anyone else, any humans, any distractions. And I can go into a spreadsheet and, and sit there for like four or five hours without even noticing, without eating or going to the bathroom or anything. And I will wow. be fully submersed in wanting to accomplish something. And that is for me really great. I think one challenge that I've experienced here, because I really want to create this awesome culture. We have such a great product and Noah is so full of energy and it, everything is super positive. Like we're making this indulgence that is delicious, that is better than something that existed before that is unlike anything in the market. There's truly nothing negative or crappy about it. It is one of the most incredible things. So I want our culture so badly to be this ray of sunshine and ray of positivity amidst all of these tasks and projects and, and hurdles. And I think it's a little hard remotely. Um, I've talked with a couple of other founders and CEOs about how they do it. I think we're doing everything we can um, and I can share what our team is doing and what we've put in place to stay connected as a team. And perhaps there's really nothing like high-fiving each other and sharing breakfasts and lunches and, you know, disappointments and failures and stresses and family stuff and banter, which perhaps I just never really appreciated when I had it. And, and maybe nothing can really replace it. But I think that has been, it hasn't been a struggle, but it's something I want so so badly for our team. I want this wonderful culture where everyone is lifted up and, and um I want to motivate our team. So sometimes I find it a little challenging because I don't know what's going on throughout, throughout everyone's minds, but we have a, a daily standing call at 9 a.m. or 9 a.m. Um, mountain time, sorry, 9 a.m. mountain time, no, 9 a.m. Pacific because we're across all coasts. So 9 a.m. 
Pacific so that the folks in California aren't terribly disrupted too early in the morning. Uh, and it's an open, it's an open call. So you hop on there. It shouldn't last more than 10, 15 minutes. Sometimes we get chatty and that's completely fine or people can hop off, but it's really meant to be a place to shoot off straight, like really fast rapid fire questions. Like, Hey, I sent you this a couple of times I need it, or this is my priority for today. Just everyone keep an eye out on Slack, but it's also a place for us to just reconnect and talk about whatever is on our minds right now we're an all-girl team so i'm like hey guys like what shampoo are you using um sometimes <laughs> other folks join in like noah's always invited so i really appreciate that moment of space that everyone holds on their calendar for each other and we try to do quarterly meetups um at least that is our intention going into 22 that is what we ended up doing in 2021 in preparing for launch especially and i think connecting with each other um in person is important. So I think once a quarter is nice. We were all in Miami for about a month for our launch with Showfields. And that was really great because we just got to be in person with each other. I think that's been the biggest struggle. Um, other than that, there's uh, a little more reporting than I thought, but I think I've heard that through every CEO is just like combining <laughs> all of these elements and how do you report on it in the best possible way? I'm a big process person. So which, you know, which tools are we using to maximize what we're doing? Um, and maybe one other thing, and this is advice I received from some folks in the CPG space when I first took this job, as if you haven't, if, you, if I haven't been clear, like community is so important to me. So I just ask people often. So when I first took this job, I kind of reached out to a few folks in the CPG space that have been doing it way, way longer than I, that are very experienced in it. They, they know me, they know my background, they know that my background is in operations specifically in supply chain and all of them across the board without talking to each other, at least I don't think, told me to be mindful of how much I am in operations. They like, you need to, you need to acknowledge that this is your knowledge base and your baby, but you have to let it go. So bringing in someone to help with that has been really hard, but also just kind of game changing because it challenges you to trust a lot. And I think across the board, maybe that's that's, that's the, the challenge in general in building a team. You have to find people that trust. And for me, I've been watching the show Co Coaches on Netflix about coaches of, of, I don't know if you've watched it, but it's coaches of it. like, it's so good. Coaches of like um, very powerful athletes and mm. just talking to them about, what it takes like what is the what is their perspective how do they do it and across the board it's just all like motivation and mindset so i think for me kind of giving that piece away and making sure that our entire team is able to trust each other to be where they need to be right i'm only one human i can't be in multiple places if i didn't trust someone to do operations i would have to drop the ball somewhere else and i want to I want to be ready for for that ball whenever someone needs to throw it to me, um, and I think that's not really a challenge. It's more of just what the learning is that I'm going through right now. I love that. Yeah, they say I haven't been a CEO yet. I've been a partner before of kind of a smaller brand. I've freelanced, but I've not been the CEO kind of in a role like you're in now. But I have heard, um, I have heard that um, one of the one of the signs of a good leader is to recognize when you need to bring in someone to kind of replace what you've been what you've been doing and to let them and to trust them trust has been a big word i've heard as well to trust that they're going to do the job that they need to do and totally. to just bring in and build a team of people that really are are smarter than you right because totally. you never want to be the smartest person in the room that's a thing that our ceo here says all the time he doesn't want to be the smartest guy in the room and if you are you're in the wrong room so it sounds like you yeah taken that to heart and have been able to build up a solid team so far. So that's great. Thanks. It's, it's again, ever changing, ever growing. And for me, definitely a learning, but it's one that uh, I feel really, really great about and really inspired by pretty much every day. So, so far um, it's been wonderful. Yeah. It helps, it helps having, having a, I think a, another thing that like in CPG, a lot of the journey is, tends to be fairly lonely, right? Like, especially now we're all kind of in our own boxes in our own homes. And I think for me, having UBS be a part of the journey besides our team has been really nice just because there is other entities, like other humans to, to, 
talk to and to brainstorm of. And at the end of the day, like we're we're social creatures, and we might need that, you know, word of acknowledgement or just another human in the room. So it's been nice having both like our team close together, as close as as I can make us in this current environment, um, and and also having the venture studio as a little bit of support for sure. That's awesome. I love that. Well, um, I've appreciated this chat. It's been fun to get to know you. It's been fun to learn about your background and all the awesome things you've done in the CPG space. So um, the last thing I want to ask you is if you have any other parting words of wisdom or any um, advice to other CPG professionals out there. I mean, this might be repeated advice because I think in the industry we say it often, but just find your find your customers and find the people that are absolutely crazy about your product. Often we want to make something, we want to put it in the world because we love it or it has solved mm -hmm. some kind of problem for us, but we are one person and we're probably, probably blinded by love. Um, as, as like a, an <laughs> entrepreneur, I've been there, like I've been blinded by this thing where of course everyone will want this and how could everyone not want this? But the truth is you just don't know. So don't be afraid. Um, I often ask myself, what would I do if I wasn't afraid? And then just kind of honestly mm. answer that question and perhaps use that as a guiding word. But I would just advise everyone to, to find the folks that love your product and use them as your voice. Because at the end of the day, they will be your loudest and best marketing and customer together. I love that. We started with a great quote about moving from failure to failure with enthusiasm. We ended with another great quote, even without you knowing That's it. Right. You know? what, would right. I, what would I do if I wasn't afraid? So I love that we can kind of have those bookends there, those motivational bookends to our chat. Yeah, you're right. I didn't even know that that was a really good one. Right on. Well, thank you again for taking the time to chat with me. It's been awesome. Thank <laughs> you.